The reality is there will be people one day who stand before the Lord, many of them, who will assume that they are about to enter heaven only to be told they're on their way to hell. This is the worst possible illusion that someone can have, to be mistaken about your eternal destiny, to be mistaken about your salvation. I'm often asked the question, are Roman Catholics Christians? And I would pose this question, are Protestants natu nat naturally or always Christians? How about another question? Are evangelicals necessarily Christians? But a more important question than any of those is, are you a Christian? Could be that you're among the many who are self-deceived. You're not alone. I am convinced that in the name of Christianity, there are many places that call themselves churches, and they're not churches. And they have men leading them who call themselves pastors, and they're not pastors. And they have congregations who call themselves Christians, and they are not Christians. They're not churches, they're not pastors, and they're not Christians. And yet they proudly post the label, Christian. Now we learned in our message last time from verses 13 and 14 that there are only two possible options. There is a narrow gate that goes to heaven and there is a broad road that says heaven but goes to hell. The narrow gate is hard to find and hard to go through because it demands denial of self, denial of self-righteousness, recognition of sin, full repentance, submission to Christ, commitment to obey Him and follow Him no matter what the cost. It's hard to find that truth, and hearing it, it's hard to act upon it because of the love of self and the love of sin, which is natural to the sinner. The true way to heaven is hard to find. It is away from the crowd. It is narrow. You come naked. You come alone. You come penitent. You strive to enter. At the same time, most religious people are on the broad road and there are plenty of false prophets who are enabling them. They are discussed, by the way, in verses 15 to 20. The false prophets, the false religious leaders, the false representatives of Christ, false agents of God who really are the agents of Satan, they are ministers of Satan disguised as angels of light, leading people on a road that says heaven but ends up in hell. For all the years of my ministry, there has been nothing that has come to the level of my concern for this issue. Of course it's a tragedy for Hindus to go to hell or Buddhists or Muslims. It's a tragedy for atheists and Jews who reject the Messiah to go to hell. It's a tragic for tragedy for anybody to go to hell. But it seems to me that the tragedy of all tragedies is the oft-repeated Judas tragedy where you hang around Jesus but end up belonging to Satan. That's the real tragedy. There are pastors who fit into this category. They're not even Christians. And churches are filled with people. Some quote-unquote churches are made up almost all of non-Christians who are deceived about their true spiritual condition. 
And so it's important for us to hear the words of the Lord. If I'm concerned about this issue, believe me, He's far more concerned about it as well. And when the Lord said these words, He was not speaking to irreligious people. He was speaking to fastidiously religious people. He was speaking to people who were religious to the max, I suppose we could say. They were obsessed with religion. In fact, they couldn't divorce their social life, their civil life, their economic life, their family life, their national life from their religion. It permeated everything in Israel. These are the most religious people. These people are as religious as you can get. But they have no relationship to God and no relationship to Christ. They are religious but lost. They are on the wrong road. To borrow the words of Paul, they have a form of godliness without the reality of it. They are self-deceived. We have that today, as I said. It is everywhere, everywhere. People who in some way or another are connected to the idea of God and even Jesus, but utterly devoid of any divine life, any knowledge of God, any salvation at all. We have multitudes of deceived souls within churches who are on some kind of Jesus trip, thinking all is well. And the words of our Lord in this text uh, really are the best words to deal with this deception. And I'm sure it's not just a deception that's out there somewhere beyond us. I'm sure it's a deception that is here within us. It, of course, would be the tragedy of all tragedies, but it will occur and it does occur and it will continue to occur that someone would sit at Grace Community Church and end up saying, but Lord, but Lord, only to hear, depart from Me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you.
Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. These are the words of God. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our Father and gracious God, I pray you'd be with us this morning as we open your word. I pray that your spirit would open our hearts at the same time we're opening your word. And I pray you would pour your word into us. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I read Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. My text is mainly the first verse. I, I wanted to read verse 2 so you could see the context of it. One very common problem that Christians have in their Christian lives is the problem of spiritual clutter. That problem is addressed in verse 1. Every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, or the sin that so easily entangles. The problem of clutter. Many Christians don't know what to do with various unresolved sins and problems, and so they do nothing. Over time, these unaddressed problems accumulate, and before long, there is a real mess. And you've seen this phenomenon in various places, have you not? It happens in closets, it happens in your junk drawer, it happens in your home's designated fright room, it happens in the back of your garage, it happens when your garden fills up with weeds and so on. Why wouldn't it happen in your spiritual life? Why wouldn't it happen there? It certainly will if you let it. So let's lay aside every weight. Let's do something with the sin that so easily besets us. Lay that aside as well. So we're going to talk this morning about how do you lay 
sin aside? How do you lay that weight aside? So one of the first things that Christians need to learn is this. They need to learn to deal with the sin of not really dealing with sin. That, that might be, in, in some sense, the primal sin. The primal sin is not dealing with sin. If we're, told to, if we're told to lay aside every weight, then it would be a sin not to. If we're told to deal with the sin that so easily besets, then it would be a sin not to. And this is the sin of not dealing with sin. This is the sin of not addressing sin rightly. So, I want to begin by talking about how important it is to not kid yourself. The first thing to realize about all of this is that confession of sin is an ongoing necessity. It is not an optional activity. I describe the problem as being one of spiritual clutter, but the thing about clutter is that you get used to it. You get used to it as it accumulates. You begin by thinking that perhaps your life is quote unquote a little untidy and then you move on to excuse the fact that it looks like a bomb went off in your conscience. And by the end of the process, your conscience looks and smells like a closet at the crazy cat lady's house. And you've gotten used to it by increments. You've gotten used to it gradually. This is just the way life is, you think. So ongoing and regular confession of sin is a necessity for everyone. And we try to mark this liturgically by having confession of sin in every worship service and having it at the beginning of the worship service so that we can wash our hands and before we come into the presence of God so that we can deal with things on our conscience before we come into the presence of God. But this liturgical confession of sin, uh, although we want it to be done conscientiously and honestly on the Lord's Day, that's not the only time we want it done. It's sort of a model for how we ought to be acting all the time. The, the, think of the worship service in many respects as a set of training wheels. The worship service trains you how to praise God. The worship service teaches you how to sing psalms. The worship service should teach you how to confess your sins. So, ongoing, regular confession of sin is a necessity for all. What must you do if you want your garden to be full of weeds? What do you have to do in order to get your garden full of weeds? Do you have to go down to Barnes & Noble and buy a book, how to, how to have your garden fill up with weeds? No, what you need to do is absolutely nothing. Just let it ride. If you do nothing, you will have knee-high weeds by mid-July. We know that sin can accumulate in just this way because of the way Scripture speaks of it. If we just go on in our own fashion, we will get used to how disheveled we are. We will get used to how disheveled we are. You've probably seen this in um, various circumstances where some homeless guy or someone who is um, completely discomposed, completely out of it, not fitting into society at all, with absolutely no awareness that that's what's going on. Right? He doesn't know how odd it is or how messed up it is. Well, that's not, that's not that one weird guy on the bus. That's not the one weird guy on the subway. That's everybody. Everybody does that. Everybody adjusts to the way things usually are. That's, this is just the way business is done in this business. This is just the way it is in our office here. Well, this is just how our family is. Now, that's what we're doing is we're getting used to things that God says, God commands us not to get used to them. So if we look into the looking glass of Scripture, we're going to see there our true condition. The only place we're going to see ourselves accurately is here. If you look in a physical mirror, what you're looking at is something you've gotten used to. Right? You, you think it's normal to comb your hair that way because that's how you do it. Right? And that's what you see every morning. So you, if you look into a physical looking glass, you're just going to see what you've grown accustomed to. If you look into the looking glass of the word, you're going to see your true condition. You're going to see it the way it really is. Now, you don't, lo you don't learn your true condition by means of morbid introspection. We learn our true condition through faithful and submissive Bible reading. Not morbid introspection. Uh, there are some people who, who their, their pe peculiar form of sin is the, the sin of going into a, a closed room and kicking themselves around as though Jesus didn't die for your sins. All right. Well, I, yeah, I said that. I shouldn't have said that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go 
uh, torment myself for the next three weeks over my loose tongue and how bad a Christian I am. I'm going to kick myself. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to punish myself as though God didn't punish Jesus, as though God didn't lay all your sins on Jesus. What you need to do is confess your sin, not try to pay for them yourself, not try to redefine them, not try to hide them, not try to pay for them yourself. So what we need to do is look in the looking glass of Scripture. This is the way James puts it in James 1.25. He says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. All right, so we're commanded to look into the perfect law of liberty. We're commanded to look to the word, and we're to do what we see commanded. We're to do what it says to do. If it says to believe, we should believe. If it says to rise up, we should rise up. If it says to forgive, we must forgive. We look into the glass, the looking glass of Scripture, and we do what it says. That's, that is like looking into a physical mirror and seeing your hair is out of place and combing your hair where you see it's out of place. When you look in the word, you see yourself. When you, when you go into a, a fit of morbid introspection, you're not really seeing yourself. You're, not, you, you're abusing yourself, but you're not really seeing what the actual problem is. You think the actual problem is, you know, whatever it was you said that, that made your, face, your friend's face look funny. And, you know, oh, you know what I'm talking about, the glance, the glance with a thousand meanings. And, and you look at them and you're real sensitive and say, so maybe it was this and maybe it was that and maybe they hate me and maybe, you know, blah, 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 and down the wormhole you go. What, what you need to do is, what is your actual sin that you're committing right there? Your actual sin right there is you're trying to be your own, very own personal Holy Spirit. You're trying to convict yourself of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You're trying to apply your own holy law to your own condition, and you have no right. No right to apply your, you have no right to make up laws. You have no right to make up, make up a standard, and you, know, have, you have no right to condemn yourself. Who will lay a charge against the Lord's elect? Who's going to lay a charge against, it's God who justifies. If, if God says no one can lay a charge against God's elect and you're one of God's elect, that includes you. You don't get to lay a charge against yourself either. You, what you want to do is say, okay, I want in my sanctification, I want to correct the sins I'm actually committing. I don't want to correct the sins that I imagined that I was committing because I'm that kind of person who likes to abuse himself. So you look into the perfect law of liberty. This is why you need to be Bible readers. This is why you need to be regular Bible readers. This is, what, this is why we emphasize in our community the Bible reading challenge. We want people to see themselves accurately. So no one should ever simply assume that he's, quote unquote, doing fine simply because the roof hasn't fallen in yet. Psalm 130 verse 3 says, If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? If God decided to really come after you and find fault with everything you did wrong in a given day, do you th might he find something? Right? If God were to mark iniquities, if God were to get out a red pen and say, I'm going to mark up your paper, the, the paper you turned in today, and I'm going to mark it up savagely, do you think he'd be able to find, do you think there'd be any red ink on any of our papers? Well, yes. Lord, if you should mark iniquities, who shall stand? Scripture tells us our true condition if they sin against thee, this is Second Chronicles 6.36, if they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them. Also cross-referenced in Job 4, 18 and 19. The Apostle John sums all of this up in 1 John 1, verse 8 and verse 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's verse 8. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So verse 8, if we say we haven't sinned, we deceive ourselves. That means that we are the liar and the lied to. We are the liar and the lied to. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar, because he says that we have sinned. It says, well, if God were to mark iniquities, who would stand? It says there's no, in Second Chronicles, there's, there's no man who sins not, and so on. So if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar. So that means that our garden grows weeds. Whoever you are, whether, whether you grew up in the church or not, your garden grows weeds. Your closet 
gets cluttered. Your kitchen sink fills up with dirty dishes. What well, you live in this world, do you not? And if you live in this world, then this is an ongoing reality. And that means you have to deal with it. And the difference between someone whose Christian life is in order and someone whose Christian life is not in order is not that one sins and the other doesn't sin. The difference between them is the, the, Christian life, the, the Christian life that is in order is the Christian life of someone who deals with sin when it happens, who picks up when it happens, who addresses it right away. So there's an ongoing need. Suppose a young man is learning how to do maintenance on his car. And he's told to change his air filter every 12 to 15,000 miles. And then suppose he were to ask his instructor, the, the person who's teaching him engine maintenance, he were to ask his instructor whether he would still have to do this if the filter hadn't gotten dirty yet. Do I still have to change the air filter if it's not dirty? The problem with this young man is that he doesn't know what kind of world he's living in. The problem is not that he doesn't understand cars. The problem is he doesn't understand the world. You need to understand the world. Your hands get dirty. Your life gets dirty. Your life gets cluttered. You don't make every decision right. You respond wrongly. You, you have an, uh, an attitude well up in your heart that shouldn't be there. And that, all of that clutters it up. All of that accumulates. All of that gets to the point where after a week and a half of that, you're grumpy at everyone and don't know exactly why. Right? Well, it's because of the condition, uh, the condition of the living room you're trying to live in. So what to do? The way to deal with the effects of such accumulated guilt through sinning is by means of confession. Now, there's an important distinction to be made here, and I hope to jump up and down on it. The verse right in, I read 1 John 1.8 and 1 John 1.10. The verse right in between those two verses says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this is a glorious promise, so let's take a moment to consider it very carefully. In this verse, we are described a certain way, and then we are told to do something. We're described a certain way, and then we're told to do something. In addition, God is described a certain way, and then he does something. We are a certain kind of uh, entity, a certain kind of person, and then given that we're to do something, God is a certain way, and then he does something. We are described as sinful. We cannot confess sins unless we actually have some, right? So we're described as sinful. So we're described as sinful, and what we're told to do is to confess those sins. Confess those sins. God is described as being faithful and just, and what he does is forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are sinful, and he is righteous. We do the confessing, and he does the cleansing. We must not think, must never think, that we do the cleansing. It is not the case that we have to clean ourselves up before we can appear before God. Because no one would ever be able to appear before God. Because we can't clean, up, we can't clean ourselves up. We don't clean ourselves up. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and he does the cleansing. And cleanse us from what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do the confessing, he does the cleansing. When we confess our sins, we are not cleaning up. When we are confessing our sins, we are asking someone else to clean us up. When we confess our sins, we are not doing the cleaning. You make a mess of something, you, let's say you... Uh, you uh, left the water on uh, when you during a cold snap and di didn't turn the water off and you're going to be out of town the pipes froze then it thawed then everything flooded and and you come back to a house that's a total wreck and you realize slapping your forehead this was my fault i didn't do this i was reminded three times to turn you know to turn the i was i was reminded three times to deal with this and i didn't and i've got a, i've got a total mess here in my house Confession of sin says, this is my bad. But you're not service master. Right? You call service master. You, you call them up and say, I did a really bad thing, and my house is destroyed. Would you come and deal with it? Would you come and fix it? Would you come and address it? You don't do the cleansing. 
You do the confessing. Now, if and the, so the position that we're in when we when our lives don't get cleansed, don't get cleaned up, is we we want somehow service master to come in and, and fix everything without calling them. We want them to anticipate what happened. We want them to come, and we want to be able to save our pride and say, "Man, don't tell him what happened." I, aliens, I think it was aliens. <laughs> And we, so we're the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit, the serpent begot me, you know, all this sort of stuff. But what God says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. We confess. That's what we do. We confess. So what is it to confess then? What is it to confess? The Greek word that is rendered here as confess is homologeo. Homologeo. And it, it's a very interesting compound word. The first part, hama, is the Greek for same. It's the Greek for same. The legeo is a verb that means to speak. So hama legeo, um, homosexual means same sex, homosexual, same sex. Hama means same. Legeo uh, is the verb form. Logos is the noun form. So logos is the word. Legeo is to speak the word. So hama legeo means to speak the same thing. To say the same thing. To speak the same thing. So if we put them together, this means to acknowledge. To speak the same thing. If, if scripture calls something a lie, and you call it a mild prevarication, then that is not confession. If scripture calls it adultery, and you call it infatuation, then that's not confession. If scripture calls it theft, and you call it requisitioning, then that is not confession. The reason it's not confession is that it is dishonest. Now, in the call to worship, um, you were reminded that this worship service is for kids. And this message on confession of sin is not just for the adults. It's for kids. Kids lie about their siblings, don't they? Kids don't tell mom the truth when she asks who did this. Kids sometimes help themselves to money out of mom's purse. Kids in doing their schoolwork can cheat on their schoolwork. All of these are sins. And God requires every baptized Christian to do the same thing with their sins, which is confess them. Right? You confess your sins. And you confess it using the same name that God uses. What would God call this? And then you call it the same thing. What, what does God call this? And you call it the same thing. Thing. So the central issue in confession of sin is therefore honesty. That's the central issue. Confession of sin is, something, is neither more nor less than honesty with God. That's what it is. He that covereth his sins, it says in Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28 verse 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. He that covereth his sins, that's the dishonesty, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Adam hiding in the bushes. He hears the Lord coming, Adam hides. That's the, that's the first reflexive move that a sinner makes. Nobody knows about this. Nobody needs to know about it. Nobody, this is, this is, uh, this is just me. I, I have to work through this. I realize this is not I'm not doing the greatest at human flourishing right now. That wasn't the best, but I'll have to, I'll work it out myself. No, you won't. You can't clean it up yourself. And you're doing the very thing that is antithetical to God cleaning it up because you're refusing to acknowledge, refusing to confess. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. And God, God is the one who prospers us. And that means, and he sees everything. God is the one who dispenses blessings or not. God is the one who blesses and curses. God is the one who opens his hands and says, this, this is uh, my blessing for you, or he withholds that. And he's, he's the one who does that, and he's the one who knows whether or not we are covering our sins in a dishonest way. What we have to do is honestly bring them to him, and then he covers them in an honest way. Because the blood of Jesus Christ is an honest covering. The blood of Jesus Christ tells the truth about the world, tells the truth about Jesus, tells the truth about God, tells the truth about everything. So the blood of Jesus Christ covers, the, covers our sins honestly. Our lame attempts 
cover our sins dishonestly. And when we try to cover our sins dishonestly, we don't prosper. That's why, we, that's why our Christian life is such a struggle. That's why your marriage is such a struggle. That's why your child rearing is such a struggle. I'm not talking about the ordinary hard work. The, you know, a good marriage is hard work. Bringing up kids in the Lord is hard work. D- working, uh, um, achieving excellence in your profession is hard work. But there's a different, there's a different sort of hard work that's, the, uh, that's being addressed in Hebrews 12. Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles. Suppose... Suppose you went to visit someone in his shop, and he, he had a very difficult job, very challenging job assembling some, you know, uh, assembling some delicate mechanism, and you wanted to go see how he did it. And you go in there, and he's, he's working away, but he's got a 150-pound backpack on, and he's wrapped a bunch of extension cords around him, and everything, every time he moves, something catches. And you say, you, is, is that, is that the, this is hard work, but are you, are you, aren't you making it extra hard? Yeah, there's that extra hardness. That extra hardness is what I mean when, when, you, when you look at your family and say, I don't think we're thriving. It's the extension cord around your head. Not, I'm not talking about marriage and family being easy because it isn't. But there's a good, honest challenge in honest work, hard work, that you, you, you go through the day of hard work and you come to the end of the day satisfied and that's very different than coming to the mid-morning frustrated. When you get to mid-morning and you're frustrated, you're probably dealing with weight and the sin that so easily entangles. So we're not talking about a hardship per se. We're talking about a particular kind of hardship, a particular kind of stupid hardship. So a paraphrase of Proverbs 28 would therefore be that people who are dishonest about the way they are living are people who will not flourish. People who are dishonest about the way they're living are people who will not prosper. These are people who will not flourish, they will not prosper, because God's word declares that they will not prosper. Their life, their vocation, everything they set their hand to is snake bit. It's, it, they're going to have difficulty with it. The alternative is what is, is, what is promised to the honest, Honest confession and honest forsaking results in honest mercy. Honest confession, honest forsaking results in honest mercy. And this honest mercy means that God is blessing that man. And nothing bad comes from this. Nothing bad comes from the favor of God. When God smiles on you, when God smiles on your endeavor... When God smiles on your morning, when God smiles on your afternoon, when God smiles on your child rearing, what is happening is honest mercy, nothing bad, right? He gives you the, he gives you the desire of your heart and he adds no sorrow to it. But there's, a, there's another way of proceeding and that's to scrabble and grab and, and fuss and whine and moan. And it just doesn't, the alternative is say, God, here I am. Look at this. This is everything. And not, not have anything covered up, not, not trying to hold anything back. In Psalm 32, it says this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, back in Proverbs, we're told, don't cover your own sin. Don't cover your own sin. Not because sin doesn't need to be covered. It's because sin doesn't need to be covered by you. Don't cover your own sin. Um, when, when Adam and Eve hide, they're trying to cover their sin. But when God comes down and gives them the first promise of the gospel in Genesis 3.15, one of the things that God does is he kills some animals and he makes them a covering. God makes them clothing. All right? It was a problem that they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. With, that, that was a problem because they were trying to do it themselves. But God covers them. So the issue is not, I'm a sinner, I'm a mess, I'm, I've got all these problems, and this needs to be covered. That instinct is correct. This needs to be addressed. This needs to be covered. But you can't cover it. God is willing to cover it. But what you must do is confess that this is totally uncovered. <laughs> this is 
totally before you. You see every corner of it. You see every nook and cranny of it. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered by another. Blessed is the man whose sin is covered by another. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit, I want you to notice this phrase, and in whose spirit there is no guile. There's the issue of honesty again. And in whose spirit there is no guile. You've sinned this last week, you've sinned early this morning, you sinned yesterday, and you hear God's footsteps coming in the garden. What is the reaction? What is the reaction? Is, do you flinch and say, I need to come up with some guile? Or do you say, I need to throw myself on God's mercy? I need to confess what I've done openly and honestly. Forgiven transgression is the blessing of God. Forgiven transgression is the blessing of God. To have sin covered is the blessing of God. To not have iniquity imputed to you when it easily could have been imputed to you is the blessing of God. So in the service, when the minister declares, your sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ, that is an authoritative word, and it it can be apprehended by faith by everyone who is honest with God. Right? The, the, the person who comes into a, a Christian worship service and says, I'm going to deal with my sin, but I'm going to deal with it with guile. I'm going to deal with my sin, but I'm going to deal with it myself. So the bank robber just knocked off a bank, and he, and he comes down, and he, hear, he hears the singing and recognizes the song and decides to stop into a worship service. And he stops into a worship service with a suitcase full of money that he just stole. What does he have to do? What does he have to do? Well, he, he doesn't get to hear those words, your sins are forgiven through Christ, and everybody say, thanks be to God, and have him come to, oh, oh, thanks be to God. Forgiveness and a lot of money. No, that's not how it works. Why? Because the, the promise that's contained in the authoritative ministerial word is a promise that's apprehended only by faith. Only faith can apprehend that promise. And when faith apprehends the promise, it has to do so honestly, because if it's dishonest, it's not faith. If it's honest faith, it confesses. If it's honest faith, it lets everything go. So, note that descriptor, in whose spirit there is no guile. Honesty before God is therefore the ticket. Honesty before God is therefore the ticket. And you begin by confessing dishonesty. Remember, I said earlier, the primal sin is the sin of not dealing with sin. So what is the thing that keeps us from dealing with sin? It's dishonesty with God. So the first sin that must be confessed would be the sin of all the workarounds, all the excuses, all the renaming. Uh, You know, well, that was, yeah, I I sinned against my mom when I I talked back to her, but she started it, frankly. And I'd confess my sin if she would, if she would, you know. If she went first, or if my teacher went first, or if my boss went first, I would say, yeah, me too, or something like that. But that's not, that's in whose spirit there is no guile. Honesty before God is therefore the ticket. And even there, remember that God were to, if God were to mark iniquities, no one could stand. And that includes, if God were to mark iniquities in our confessions, no one would stand. Right? I said earlier, if God decided, I'm going to grade this paper harshly, you, it, you know, whatever paper you turn in, if God said, I'm going to guard it, grade it harshly, all of us would have bleeding red all over it, right? But that includes the paper that we turned in confessing our sins. You know, this is, here's my confession of sin paper. If God were to mark iniquities there, am I toast? Am I hosed? Yeah, yeah. If God were to mark iniquities in our confessions... No one could stand. And this is why, in the next verse, I, I'm, I've been in 1 John 1, at the tail end of 1 John 1. What does it say at the beginning of 1 John 2? My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, putting you back at the tail end of chapter 1, if any man sin, just like 1 John 1.8 and 1 John 1.10 says that you're going to, 
And 1 John 1, 9 says that you need to confess that sin. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In other words, Jesus has to do your confessing. You can't confess the right way. You can't confess without guile. You can't confess without hedging or trimming or backfilling or waffling or noodling. You know, you've, you're going to want to... And what you need to do is say, Jesus, this confession of sin paper that I have to write, would you write it for me? Would you turn it in for me? Can I, can I, or can I, can I write it and you sign your name to it? Why? Why can we do that? It says, we have an advocate with the Father. We have a defense attorney. It's a legal term here. We have a defense attorney assigned to our case. That defense attorney is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the defense attorney says, yes, he, uh, this, there are all sorts of uh, problems with this confession. If we were to consider it in its own right, on its own two legs. But fortunately for him, that's not how we're considering it. We're considering it as incorporated into and folded into the work of atonement that Christ accomplished on the cross, which it says here. And he is the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation is, uh, it means the turning aside of wrath. So when Jesus was on the cross in his cry of dereliction, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That moment of desertion where the father turned his face of favor away from the Lord Jesus. And Jesus felt the abandonment of God. And he felt the abandonment of God because he took your lame confessions onto himself. He took your excuses onto himself. He took all your dishonesty onto himself. He is the propitiation, and, and, he, and he felt the wrath of God. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. That's what it means to confess your sins in Jesus' name. So you're not trying to do it perfectly. You just want to do it honestly. And you, is, you want to be like the man in the Gospels. Um, Jesus says, everything is possible to him who believes. And the man cries out, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, I want to be honest. Help my dishonesty. Lord, I want to be open. Help my, my guile. Lord, I want, to be, I want to do this right, and I know that I can't do this right, and I know that if you forgive my sins, you're going to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But this can only be done in Jesus Christ. And when it is done in Jesus Christ, the end result is forgiveness. Blessed is the man to whom, um, as it says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. It's all Jesus, all Jesus, all the time. So we're Christians. That means we have to worship God in, in Jesus' name. We confess our sins in Jesus' name. We take the Lord's Supper in Jesus' name. We baptize, as we did this morning, in Jesus' name. We, we do everything we do in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name means that everything is covered the right way. Everything is covered the right way. But what's necessary is for you to recognize that that's the only way it's going to be covered the right way and abandon every attempt to cover it yourself. That's what, that's what confession of sin amounts to. And when that starts to happen, when that catches fire in any community, that is what revival looks like. Our Father in God, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for all that you've given us in the gospel. We thank you for the grace that extends to us, the invitation to confess our sins. I pray, Father, that we would learn to do this and that your spirit would teach us. As we offer up this prayer, we would uh, also pray to you the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, When Christ established this meal with his disciples, he also did something else that evening in the upper room. He rose from the table, laid aside his outer clothing, and tied a towel around his waist. He then poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, wiping them dry with a towel wrapped around him. He took the place of a servant. But when he came to Peter, the disciple objected, saying, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered Peter, saying, If I do not wash you, 
you have no part with me. Peter felt that there was something deeply wrong with allowing Christ to serve him. And in one sense, he was most certainly right. But he still did not yet understand the story he was in and what else his servant was about to do on his behalf. And like Peter, we too can balk at Christ serving us. We are often embarrassed to be approached by him. What if he knew that thought you had earlier? What if he heard those careless words you spoke to your spouse? the impatient cursing under your breath. Surely, if he knew what a mess you are, he would not want to serve you. And yet, Christ knows it all. He knew the weakness of his men that night and how they would desert him. He knew their sin, and he still washed their feet and dined with them. He still suffered and died for them and for you. So let go of your sin. Let go of your vain pride. Christ has taken care of it all. Do not look at yourself now to see if you are worthy, and instead look to him and this table he has prepared for you. And come and welcome to Jesus Christ. The charge is this. We we like to tell ourselves that, well, we'd love to have our lives in order again. We'd love to have everything put back together, but unfortunately it depends on things that that are just beyond us. I can't do it. I'm, I'm not up to the challenge. But the real problem is not that God asks you to do things you can't do. It's that he's told you to do something you don't want to do. That's the, that's the hitch. That's the problem. Because he does all the hard lifting. He does the forgiving. He does the cleansing. What we do is the acknowledging. And that's, that's, that's simply it. Acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge. So with believing hearts, go with the benediction of your God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church for Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.
ты такой? Ты что за день такой? Да погладимся, погладимся, да погладимся.